and I think we are live so hi there everyone um, it's lovely to see you all again for those new my name is Nikki I'm an author and editor and I post videos here on YouTube about writing editing reading and all the things I love now um, today I am talking about the books I've been reading during January it's part of my end of the month reading wrap-up now uh, what I will just say, for those of you who didn't see my film and TV wrap-up yesterday, usually I do pre-film these videos, uh, I do them in my library, um, they're all nicely edited and uploaded. H however, um, that process for those two end of the month videos usually takes me around four hours altogether. Some months that's not a problem, but some months I find that's a little bit pressure on me because I've got a busy couple of days right at the end of the month and I'm trying to get this stuff done. So. I'm just experimenting with doing these as live streams at the end of the month instead because then I only have the time really of few minutes to set up and the time to actually just sit here and talk through the video and that's a huge time saver for me. We're cutting down four hours to probably about an hour and a half. So I'm going to see how it goes but certainly we're going to give it a try this month. Now I've had quite a busy reading month. I've read I think something like 25 books so without any further ado, I will press on and run through them. I should say I was a bit later than I planned today because I the weather was a bit cooler for a change, which was lovely. And I nipped out and did a walk around the block, did some shopping. Um, it seems, seems to have played havoc with my sinuses though, too much fresh air obviously, and my nose keeps running. So I really hope I'm gonna be able to get through this video without having to keep pulling tissues up, but we'll see how we go. So uh, I've got all my notes here and we'll crack straight on now that I've waffled for long enough. So first of all, um, Wakenhurst by Michelle Paver. This is a book I received from NetGalley. Essentially, it's a gothic uh, mystery, I guess you'd call it. It's set in a uh, house, a, you know, a big sort of slightly dilapidated um, ancestral home on the moors. And it mainly revolves around a slightly tyrannical father and his daughter and uh, a mystery of um, what goes on and he starts to act a little bit bizarrely and I can't really say too much more than that because I don't want to give away the plot but I thought it was it was a good fun piece um nicely written some of the twists I anticipated but a few caught me by surprise which was nice and overall I gave this uh four stars it was a good fun gothic mystery if that's your kind of thing the next one I read was The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham now this is technically a reread I did read this book when I was younger um and it was, it was fun uh, to go back to those childhood memories. I actually rem do remember it quite well um, as I was reading it. It was all very familiar. And it's, it's a fun, um, engaging story for kids. So I'm giving that four stars too. Next up, another reread in a way, was The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Uh, Wells. Um, this is a book that I did read at university. However, this edition also included a couple of other stories, both featuring sort of animals. One of them was uh, ants that are sort of taking over in this jungle area in South America. Um, four stars again. <laughs> We're just having a little bit of a four star run here at the moment, but four stars again. Uh, it was a really nice collection. The stories all worked really well together. Um, it felt like a sort of common theme running through them. And um, they are interesting and engaging classic short stories. Next up, sticking with the classics, uh, The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner by James Hogg. And this is an interesting book. I haven't read this one before. And I gave it four and a half stars. It's a quite an interesting and work in terms of the fact that it's fairly psychological, um, particularly considering the time it was written. I mean, I guess it's, it's sort of almost contemporary with Dostoevsky and the like. So I guess those kind of novels were coming in at that point. But it's a tale of a man who um, ends up doing quite a lot of despicable things, but he has this justification for them. He has this really strong Calvinist um, upbringing. And I, again, I don't want to kind of ruin the story by saying too much about it, but it is a really fascinating work and it's kind of split into two parts. Um, first, you get a kind of editor's um, summation of what went on, and then you get what are supposedly the memoirs of this main character. And it's quite interesting to see um, the different way in which the editor and then uh, the justified sinner, um, the, the narrator, review um, uh, the same events. They both have a very different take on it. It's um, very much a uh, subjective view. So um, moving on then, another classic was Ethan Frome by Edith Wharton. 
and this is another four and a half stars for me. It's quite a short little piece, um, really only a novella, but I thought it was beautifully written. Um, you really get a great sense of place of this sort of like uh, winter in New England. And um, yeah, it's a, a little bit melodramatic at times, I guess I would say. So you, you might sort of roll your eyes a little bit at some of the events that go on. And please excuse me, because the dust cart has just pulled up outside. So if you can hear this racket, uh, that's just the dust cart. He will disappear in a minute. Um, and then moving on anyway to another classic work, Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. This was a four star read for me. Uh, for those who don't know, it's kind of political philosophy, I would say. Um, and it was written uh, by Hobbes just a few years after the events of the English Civil War, which is quite interesting because you can see how those events have um, affected his thoughts and you can see how in some ways some of the things he's saying is a commentary on the Civil War and what happened during that period. So it's fascinating. Um, in many ways a lot of it is still relevant today, so it's definitely worth a read, but it is it's fairly heavy going. I mean, I didn't read this as a bedtime read. I had kept this in my library. And if I had an odd 10 minutes free during the day, I read a few pages until I finished it. Um, it's not what I'd take to bed for um, relaxing reading, but it is very interesting. Next up, um, another classic. I got a few classics for Christmas and birthday, so um, that's why there's so many this month. Uh, Beyond Good and Evil by Nisha. Um, this was three stars for me. Now, this is philosophy. Um, I think some of the trouble with this piece is that it's very much fixed in its time and for us as modern readers a lot of his views come across as a little bit dubious i mean the way he talks about women in particular but uh some other things as well i think it's hard for modern readers it, it feels very dated now um a lot of the, the things he's suggesting we would just like not even contemplate anymore so it's fascinating um as a historic document and uh, looking at how people thought at that time but um, as a modern reader, it's probably a little bit difficult. And again, it's not a bedtime read. This is another like Hobbes that he flick through a bit during the day. Um, sticking with the classics yet again for Reflections on the Revolution in France by Edmund Burke. Uh, this is another one that is really an afternoon read rather than a nighttime um, relaxing session. Uh, I gave this four stars. It's some really interesting ideas. Um, it's quite fascinating, actually, that his comments on the revolution, some of the things he's saying, I don't agree with, but some of them actually did come to pass. Um, things did fail for the reasons that he predicted in the letter. Well, it's actually a letter he wrote to um, a nobleman in France who was requesting his views on the subject. And um, interestingly enough, um, he couldn't c contain himself, really. It became like a huge essay. Um, so it's fascinating uh, what he's saying really enjoyed reading it um once or twice i was like oh that's a little bit harsh um his thoughts on some of the things but at the same time he made a lot of really insightful points as well so next up um another classic um Soano de bergerac by edmund rostand um this is a play and of course everyone knows the story of Soano. i think um what with all the different film versions and things that have gone on over time uh, this was five stars for me. Um, the translation, I thought, worked really well. Um, the rhymes and the rhythm of the um, poetry and the prose, they were all there. Um, it was a really skillfully handled translation, so uh, definitely worth reading anyway. It's, it's such a funny piece, and yet also quite poignant at times as well. Moving on, uh, the next piece I read was Moonstone by Icelandic writer Sjön. And this is a five star read for me. Again, it's a really beautiful lyrical work. I mean, I've been a fan of Haltor Laxness, um, an Icelandic writer for a while. And I have recently discovered Sjön. I, I read The Blue Fox last year and I'm now reading a few more of his works. Um, he's, a, he's a bit more modern than Laxness, but I love them both. They both have a really brilliant way of uh, evoking Iceland uh, as a place. It almost becomes a character in its own right in the stories. This one was set uh, during the uh, Spanish influenza outbreak, sort of World War One Spanish influenza. Um, and it's about this boy who, uh, he's kind of working as a male prostitute essentially. And he gets caught up in these events. He loves the cinema. He spends most of his money going to films in uh, Reykjavik. Um, but at the end of the book, we're left questioning, did this boy ever actually exist? Um, it's, it's a real sort of, uh, it feels like in some ways a, a magical realism piece. You're kind of left with all these um, questions at the end of, um, is what you just read 
uh, true? Did it really happen? Or is this all just a figment of someone's imagination? Next up, uh, Kiss of the Spider Woman by Memoir Puig. Um, five stars for me, this is such an amazing piece, such a clever work. I'm not gonna actually go into too many details about it. Uh, basically, if you don't know the story, it's um, set in a prison in Argentina in the 1970s. And it uh, takes place between these two cellmates, um, Valentin, who's a revolutionary, uh, he's been arrested as a political prisoner, and Molina, who is a window dresser. Um, homosexual or trans, it kind of depends how you view him. In the book, interestingly, I definitely read him as trans, as a, a woman trapped in a man's body. But in different interpretations of this piece um, that happened later, film, musical, um, that kind of becomes a little bit less clear as you go through these different uh, adaptations. But in the book, I, I definitely read that he felt he was a woman. And they're very antagonistic at first. Obviously, they're two very different people. But um, they're stuck together in this cell. And Melina likes to tell stories of movies. He's a big movie fanatic, um, which helps them pass the time. And they build up this kind of rapport in a way that um, they come to accept each other and learn things about themselves at the same time. And the reason I'm not going to talk any more about it now is because my good friend Elena Popescu and I will be doing a live stream just talking about this book on Sunday. We'll be on her channel. Um, you'll find a link to Alina's channel um, on my YouTube channel. She's one of my recommended channels there. Uh, so do go follow her as well. And we are going to be doing probably an hour, hour and a half long discussion about this book and its adaptations. So do join us on Sunday for that. And it's going to be, um, it's 4 p.m. my time in Central Australia. Um, so it's going to be pretty late at night, I think, for you guys in America. But you might just about be up to catch it. Or it will be available, of course, to watch afterwards, too. Moving on, anyway. Uh, the next book is White Stag by Cara Barbieri. This one I received as an arc from the publisher. Um, I gave it five stars. It's a YA fantasy, but and it's kind of based on a bit of folklore mythology, but it was a really fresh, original idea. I loved the characters. I thought it offered something a bit different. It avoided the typical YA fantasy love triangle, which, you know, gives it four marks for me because I'm getting so tired of that. Um, but it's really, it was an atmospheric piece. I loved the story idea um, and it was really beautifully paced. And I'm definitely looking forward to reading more in this series. Next up, I read a biography of Kendrin Ebb by James Levy, which was five stars. It was a really brilliant work, really informative. Um, I thought very fair as well. It, it didn't sort of, wasn't biased in their favour or against them anyway. It gave a sort of um, very balanced, nuanced uh, interpretation of their lives and works. Uh, in particular, I enjoyed the quite in-depth discussion of some of the musical styles, the motifs, and the way they went about composing pieces. So it, it was interesting just from a general biography kind of way, but it was also interesting from a musical uh, point of view as well. Um, connected to that, I also got the libretto of Kiss of the Spider Woman because Kendra and Ebb are the ones who wrote the musical adaptation that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, so this was um, book and lyrics by McNally and Ebb. Um, it gets five stars because this is just such an awesome show. I mean, it does change the book a bit, but I think it's a really brilliant adaptation and it's a brilliant piece in its own right, uh, brilliant musical. Um, the only thing that was a bit of a letdown in this book were the number of typos. Now, this book was only about 75 pages long, and yet I found over 30 typos in it. In fact, I did actually write to the um, print, to the publisher, to list them all and tell them that, because it really wasn't good enough, like it doesn't look like it's been proofread at all. Um, and you know, if you buy a book, I know it's not a novel, but even so, you want it to be as clean as possible. And there were quite a few really bad typos in this. So I did let them know, um, <laughs> no uncertain terms about them. Um, moving on, and back to a net gully book with Trust Exercise by Susan Choi. Uh, this is a three star read for me. The basic premise is that um, there are these kids in this performing arts high school. Um, and they particularly have one teacher who is very influential in their lives. And later on, it's looking back about was there any kind of manipulation going on? Um, were they taken advantage of because of their youth? Um, however, from the description in the blurb, I had expected a very different story than the one I actually got. I thought the idea was quite clever and I, it had a lot of potential. However, the structure of the piece just didn't quite work for me. Um, there was a lot of jumping. Um, suddenly we changed point of view completely and it took me a moment to work out what was going on. Um, I just think in execution, it failed a little bit. Um, it didn't quite live up to its promise. 
Next up was a book I received as a review copy from the author, and that is Masks by Amara Lin. Um, this is a slightly older work by Amara. She has a sequel coming out soon, which is why she was asking for reviews of the older one. I gave this three stars as well. It's um, an MM or an LGBT superhero story um, told from the point of view of the villain. So um, in that respect, I thought that was a really fresh, uh, fun, different way of doing it. I liked the characters and I liked the story, but I just felt it was way too short. It was only really pretty much a short story vaguely into a you know, perhaps a short novella, um, no more than that. And I just thought that both the characters and the plot could have done with more fleshing out. And I think it would have worked so much better. She'd taken a little bit more time, made it a bit longer and given us some, some more information, more background, more chance to get to know the characters before events took place and as events were taking place. Turn the page. In fact, I do need a quick sip of water, all this talking. When I do film these um, in advance, I do usually spit it in half, partly because my camera is, is really a photo camera. It does do videos, but it doesn't like getting too hot if you leave it on for too long. So when these videos usually take 25, 30 minutes to film, it does get a little bit upset. So I do have to kind of break it up and do a stop in between, but that does also give me a bit of a drink break as well. There, now that's dealt with. We can carry on, we've got a few left. Um, we're getting there. Uh, just bear with me a little longer. So next up we have Temeraire by Naomi Novik. This one I actually read because, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing that live stream of Back to the Spider Woman, my friend Alina and I. We, we are gonna be doing one on Temeraire as well. So that's gonna be taking place in April. Um, that'll be on Alina's channel again. But um, we'll have more information. I'll mention that at the end of my March stream, just as a reminder for you. So Temeraire, I gave it four stars. And um, this is a piece, if you don't know the series, uh, that's set during the Napoleonic Wars. So it's historical fiction in a way, but it's uh, alternate history because as well as the normal war stuff that was going on with Battle of Trafalgar and all the ship battles against Napoleon, um, there are also dragons. So this story is the first one in the series and a young Navy uh, captain finds a dragon egg during one of their raids on a French ship and he ends up being the one the dragon bonds with. So he has to leave the Navy and go and become a member of the Aerial Corps with this dragon. Uh, it faces a few difficulties along the way of, of being accepted when he hasn't been kind of born into that role. And obviously getting to know Temeraire, which is the name he gives his dragon and training together and then eventually going out and engaging the enemy in battle. Um, it's a really fun, really engaging tale. Um, I liked the way that the history was handled, the way that the new aspects were brought in. And it, on the whole, it was just a really fun read. Next up was a neck, uh, sorry, not neck gallery, read an arc from the publisher of How to Remove a Brain by David Haviland. This is nonfiction and it's basically um, little anecdotes about medicine and medical practices through the ages. Um, it was really great, amusing. It was informative at the same time. Some of the facts I knew, um, others were uh, new to me. So it was an, a really nice mix. If you're into a sort of quirky, amusing nonfiction that's not too heavy going, it's definitely one to have a look at. Next up was another arc from the author, which was Escaping Mortality by uh, Sarah Doby Bauer, or Sarah Doby Bauer, sorry, I think that's how we say it. Uh, four stars. This is the final book in a trilogy of which I'd already read the first two. Um, it's a vampire MM romance. And I thought it was a really good conclusion to the trilogy. I liked the way uh, the characters developed further in this story. And I thought it was a really nice way to wrap it all up. I mean, I think the second book out of the three is still my favorite, which is unusual. Usually the second books in the trilogies are the weakest, but in this case, the second book was my absolute favorite. But this was still a really great piece and a nice way to wrap everything up. Next up was another arc I received from the publisher and it's The Gilded Wolves by Rishani Chokshi. This is a four and a half star read for me. Um, this book was a little bit dense at times. It's set in, um, in Paris, um, Belle Epoque, roughly uh, Paris, and but with a twist, there's all this sort of magic going on. Um, a lot of it based in myth, but based on a lot of different myths, there was so much being drawn from different places. 
which I think was a little bit too much at times because it didn't make it difficult to follow. You could keep it up with the story and the characters. That wasn't a problem. But your brain at the same time was processing where all these different sections were coming from. And as such, um, it kind of pulled you out the story a bit because you were so busy picking out which bits came from different myths that uh, you kind of lost track of the characters and story for a, a little bit here and there. Um, so that was, my, that was my only complaint about it. But it was a really original idea. I loved the characters. I loved the way the piece was told through uh, multiple narration. So we got a lot of different point of views of what was going on. And I'm definitely keen to uh, read on and see what will happen next in this series. Next up was a net galley read. Uh, Nikolai Nikolaevich and Camouflage by Iosh Aleshkovsky. I said it. <sighs> um, <laughs> I was a little bit worried about that one. I thought I was going to stumble over it, but we got there. Um, this is a five star read for me. Um, it was a really funny, thought provoking. That they're two essentially short stories, short novellas, um, set during a uh, sort of Stalinist period in Russia. Um, and I thought they were amusing tales, but they also had a really great message underneath and a commentary on life in Soviet Russia. So definitely, if you like more modern Russian literature, uh, it's, it's one to check out, definitely worthwhile. Next up is the, another net galley read, The Forest of Wool and Steel by Natsu Miyashita. Uh, another five star read for me. This book is about a young boy who one day in his school hears uh, the piano tuner at work. He falls in love with the instrument um, while hearing the tuning going on and decides to become a piano tuner himself. And we kind of follow his journey as he finishes his training, uh, his school training, but then goes on to be apprenticed to these three di very different um, characters, uh, piano tuners, and he learns from them and develops his skills. It was a really lyrical um, piece, um, very poignant, very emotive, um, beautifully descriptive. And for anyone who, who loves music and particularly who loves a piano, then this is one you definitely want to read. Um, I, I just found it really enjoyable. I couldn't wait to like keep reading. Uh, the next three books are all ones that I read on Scribd, which um, I should also say Temeraire, uh, I also read on Scribd. Um, I did do a little trial of Scribd, their one month free trial during January. And I really liked it. I think they have a great selection of stuff, but I haven't carried on with the subscription at the moment simply because I, I do have a constant supply of books between ones I get for birthdays, Christmas, and stuff I get as review copies from publishers, it's very rare for me not to have something to read. So for me, paying that monthly subscription isn't worth it because I, I don't need that much material available to me. But uh, I definitely keep it in mind for the future if my situation changed and I needed a bigger supply of books because it had an, a nice lot of stuff on there. Some of the ones I read during this uh, little trial period, anyway, were Creating Musical Theatre by Lynn Kramer. Uh, this is a four star read for me. Essentially, it's interviews with choreographers. I mean, it, the front of the book says choreographers and directors, but really all of them were choreographers, some of whom also did direction. Um, it was really interesting. I, I enjoyed reading their stories of how they got into the work, um, how they approached um, choreography and direction of musicals. But I kind of wished it in, in a way that it was a slightly wider scope because creating musical theatre, um, there's a lot more that goes on that wasn't covered in this book, things like it set and costume design, uh, musical direction, um, direction by non-choreographers. So I kind of would have liked the scope to have included interviews with some of those as well, just to give a complete picture. But I mean, I haven't looked, maybe there are other books in the series that go into that as well, but it was certainly interesting, so four stars. Next up, Musical Theatre, A History by John Kendrick. This is also four stars. At the beginning, I really thought I was gonna be giving it five because it was, fascinating. It was a really thorough account. It starts as an ancient Greek, uh, ancient Greece, and moves through um, through the Georgian era, people like John Gay, um, Beggar's Opera, um, through Operetta and the glory days of Gilbert and Sullivan, into the 20th century um, with the music called Polter, the Gershwins, um, and then eventually through Rodgers and Hammerstein up to Android Webber. Um, this book came out in 2008, so it pretty much takes us up to 2007 in terms of um, new musicals and the reason I did drop it down to four um, was because at the end he kind of goes off in a bit of a rant he obviously doesn't like musicals after the 1970s and I found some of his views a little too scathing I mean 
I don't like jukebox musicals and I agree with him that they're not great and I also agree with him that merchandising has kind of taken over in musical theatre a lot but I thought some of his comments were a bit rude he actually got facts wrong he declared that the barricade scenes in Les Mis take place in 1843 which is completely wrong there in 1832 says that in the program says that on the stage when it happens so uh, you know it's a pretty crappy mistake to make and I just felt that he was a little bit prejudiced against modern musicals which is why I gave the book four stars Next up was The Opera Lover's Companion by Charles Osborne. And this was a five star read for me. And it was a really, really wonderful resource. Um, it is basically a dictionary of operas, if you like. So it gives you the plot, um, the character roles and what vocal range they are, and a little bit about the history of production um, when it, the show first went, was put on. Um, and as such, if you're an opera fan, then you definitely want to take a look at that. It's, it's not really a book you read cover to cover, it's one you dip into if you're interested in a particular opera and want to know more about it. And finally, uh, Broadway Musicals by Martin Gottfried. Um, this was three star read for me. Now this was published uh, way back, I think it was something like the early 80s, uh, late 70s, something like that. So it obviously doesn't encompass modern musicals. Uh, I thought some of the views of Gottfried in this book were a little bit um, dubious, <laughs> again, uh, in a way worse than Kenrick's actually. Uh, some of the things he said I was a little bit like on edge about, um, they wouldn't tie in with modern views, um, we look at it quite poorly. Uh, so it does make the book feel really dated. However, there are some absolutely brilliant images, particularly from older productions. Um, so just as a visual record of Broadway, um, particularly through the sort of, you know, 1900 up to 1960s. Um, it was really lovely resource. So if you're interested in uh, musical theatre history, it's worth it just for the pictures. Um, but you could probably ignore some of his writing a bit. So we finally reached the end. Ah, yay! Um, except that before we close, I'm just going to do a bit of a uh, conclusion because I've been doing these reading challenges this year. So first of all, we have uh, my own reading challenge, the Nikki J. Marcus Book Challenge 2019, which a few people are doing with me. Um, I've already crossed off 12 books out of the 25 uh, from this month's selection. Well, actually, if we, I'm including in that 12 too that I'm still reading, but I'm gonna finish at the weekend. So I will um, be talking about those next time, but. Uh, essentially, I'm, I'm almost halfway through already. I've got a few noted here of ones that I've got on my shelf there to read that will also satisfy some categories of another, what are we looking at? One, two, another three or four. So I'll hopefully get to some of those during February. And then um, I should be well on track anyway for finishing this by the end of the year. Um, there's one or two categories where I think I might struggle a bit more to find some uh, books to fit, but I will get there in the end. And finally, I'm also doing, um, for those who have been watching my vlogs, you'll know I've decided to challenge myself to read a book written by an author from born in every country in the world. Now, this is not just going to be a 2019 challenge, obviously, it's going to take me some time. But uh, I am hoping to cross a few off during 2019. And so far, I've managed to cross off three new ones. So I have my little record here of ones that I've read in the past and just flicking through for ones I've done this month. Um, Kiss of the Spider Woman by Manuel Puig uh, crossed off Argentina for me. Uh, Wakenhurst by Michelle Paver crossed off Malawi in Africa. And I've also crossed off Jordan with They Called Me White by Natasha Tynes. Now, I didn't mention that one today because it's not coming out till June and I've got to hold my review till then. So I will be talking about that one a bit later in the year. But in any case, that is three books um, crossed off for my Around the World challenge so far. And I'm nearly halfway through with my own 25 book reading challenge so everything's looking pretty good on that note i'm going to bring everything to a close for today um, we've been going about half an hour so um it's pretty good going i've got a few other things to get done now i will be back uh during february i've got a few videos already scheduled for you um in the coming weeks and then of course i'll be back at the end of the month again for my tv film and book wrap-ups uh, as I've just done the last two days. And don't forget to visit Alina Popescu's channel because I will be there with her on Sunday when we will be talking about Manuel Puig's Kiss of the Spider Woman in great detail. 
So do join us then. I'll say goodbye for now, everyone. Bye. <laughs>